Thank you. Uh, it sounds like um, you're planning some fun for the rest of the uh, workshop. Uh, I wanted to tell you also, I found out uh, JILA is where my institute is, and uh, I found out what it stands for. It stands for the joint, well, it used to stand for the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics. Okay? They named it that in the 60s, and then they, 10 years ago, looked around and nobody was doing laboratory astrophysics. So uh, just said, let's just uh, drop the acronym. Okay. So thank you for coming. Today I'd like to tell you about, um, uh, well, a little bit, well, we're going to add some tensors into this quantum stuff that we discussed. So in a, hopefully in a non-trivial way to you. So the first sort of thing I want to discuss is connections between entanglement uh, and, and tensor rank. Um, then I'll discuss um, strategies for simulating quantum computations and quantum systems that have sort of limited entanglement uh, in them. So uh, uh, this involves using an ANSATS for a quantum state called a, a matrix product state ANSATS. Uh, and those work for classically simulating um, quantum systems uh, when you have sort of limited entanglement in a way that I'll define sort of later. Uh, low entanglement states. Uh, and then finally, eh, depending on uh, how it proceeds, uh, I'll talk a little bit about tensor network states. And let's say I just say physics. Okay? I mean something specific, but fine. Okay, so. You will remember from last time uh, that we talked about entanglement of a quantum state. Uh, so I have some quantum states, psi uh, AB. It's just a unit vector uh, in this complex uh, vector space. And we, we definitely understand uh, entanglement in the setting where we are talking about asymptotic bipartite and pure states. Well, what pure state means, remember, we had a vector that we associated with a quantum state, but sort of in a slightly more complicated uh, situation, we can also associate a density matrix, uh, which is positive semi-definite in trace one. And a pure state is just uh, a a quantum state that uh, has rank one. So a quantum state we can represent as just a unit vector. Okay. So in, in that case, um, we just have an answer to how entangled is a given psi. The answer is uh, psi has, uh, well, the units of entanglement in that case are EPR pairs. And the answer to how entangled is a state psi is that it's uh, the entropy of the reduced density matrix uh, on one of the sides, which is minus trace of rho log rho. And what do we mean by this is how much entanglement we had in our quantum, in our quantum state psi? Uh, we mean that you can get uh, 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 N times entropy of rho A EPRs. Uh, you can get N times entropy of rho EPR pairs from N copies of psi. And you can also make it from N copies of, you can also make N copies of psi from this many EPR pairs. And the allowed operations you can apply to the EPR pairs are uh, LOCC, local operations in classical communication. Maybe I'll, I'll draw it, the picture over here. So uh, you'll imagine now I have a psi. I usually draw it like that. I have some A system, some B system. And A can do some partial measurement, get some outcomes, send it to B. B can do some 
other partial measurement, dependent on the outcome of Alice's measurements, send the classical outcome back to Alice. She does some conditional thing. And in the end, uh, you, can, you have such a protocol which generates you know, the right number of EPR pairs out here. OK. Uh, so actually, um, this, I'll just draw, say LOCC. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, the question is, is this M1 measuring all of the qubits or just some of the qubits, right? And uh, the answer is, this M1 no longer represents one of these measurements in a fixed basis. It's one of these generalized measurements which is associated with um, uh, some, uh, re uh, basically some, uh, it's a POVM. Do you remember I mentioned POVMs? So those are, um, partial measurements, which means they extract some information but leave coherence in the state. They don't have to be just you measure these qubits and leave those alone. It's, it's, you can actually do an arbitrary unitary, then measure some fixed qubits, and that induces uh, any measurement you like. So yeah, you're right. If you measured all the qubits here, uh, the game is over. Right? OK. So actually, even if I remove this asymptotic part, for bipartite pure states, there's a nice criterion for when I can LOCC convert psi to phi. Um, uh, so I can actually uh, transform psi sub 1 via LOCC uh, to psi sub 2 exactly when uh, The reduced density matrix of psi 2 on A uh, majorizes the reduced density matrix of psi 1 on A. So this means the spectrum of this thing majorizes the spectrum of that. Um, so uh, if you want to do anything more general than that, uh, basically LOCC is too complicated for us. If you, oh, ah, so I, what I mean is if you wanted to have a, a mixed state, um, if you wanted to have a tripartite state, if you wanted to understand an LOCC and convertibility in any situation other than bipartite pure states, um, uh, we're not going to get a simple characterization. The reason is that this can sort of be arbitrarily complicated. It happens that in these cases, um, the LOCC protocol that achieves um, these conversions is very simple. Oh, and I'm sorry, the question was, what do you mean by more generally? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, it does do partial measurements, and, and it needn't create a mixed state when you do a partial measurement, because you just update um, your state like this. Uh, let's see. Um, like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, is, the, is the reason that it's simple in this case, but not in others, that, that you, uh, if you're going from one pure state to another pure state, that you never actually uh, create a mixed state, yes, that's true, uh, uh, because you didn't have to ever do a partial measurement. That part is the part that's not true. You do have to do partial measurements. OK, can I? So what would you do if the thing you want to study is too complicated for you? Yeah, we can study something else. Yes? Um, let's see. And that's what you do. Uh, I mean, that's what we're going to talk about today. You can also try to study the, this problem, uh, but the point is it's sort of 
There are lots of ways to study it. There are partial uh, answers, but there's no, uh, actually, we don't even know, uh, given a, a mixed bipartite state, like how many, how many pure states can you, how many EPR pairs can you extract from a thing? Uh, we don't even have, although we have, <laughs> basically there's sort of like a big conjecture that, that people have more or less stopped working on because it's like there are no good attacks, but basic about when can you extract uh, no EPR pairs out of a state. Right? So even asking the question, can I extract some EPR pairs out of a state or not, seems to be a hard question for mixed states. Okay. So, uh, sorry, just move that. Uh, so instead of LOCC, we're going to look at uh, SLOCC, which is simpler LOCC. Um, it's actually called stochastic LOCC. And now, if you're trying to understand, can I generate psi 1 from psi, or can I generate psi 2 from psi 1, Um, we'll say that uh, I can generate psi 2 from psi 1 under stochastic LOCC operations exactly when there's an LOCC protocol um, that turns psi 1 into psi 2 uh, that succeeds with non-zero probability. Right, over here, we, we made statements about conversion that was deterministic, at least with very high probability. Um, here, we can just ask for a simpler thing, which is, even if you have really low probability of generating psi 2 from psi 1, is there any way you could do it? Um, so, uh, uh, one con to considering this is that uh, uh, the probability could be small. So it's, it's sort of removing, its, uh, uh, removing itself a little bit um, from the question we really wanted to answer. Um, but uh, it does have a pro, uh, which is that we can get a simpler criterion. Um, so uh, uh, can you see the bottom here or not? OK. Uh, Psi 1 can be converted under SLOCC to Psi 2 uh, exactly when there exist matrices A and B uh, such that A tensor B acting on Psi 1 equals Psi 2. Um, and you can actually generalize this for more parties. Uh, if you have lots of different parties doing measurements uh, and communicating with each other, um, <clears throat> you, can, you, can, you can take a tripartite state, say, to another tripartite state exactly when there are matrices that you multiply locally. Uh, psi 1 equals psi 2, uh, that would let you get the, the uh, state you're interested in. And actually, the protocol, let's say this is true. Um, uh, the protocol is basically uh, that um, you do a measurement. You remember um, um, partial measurements involved having these matrices. Uh, well, let me just write it down. Having these E's such that the sum of EK, EK, over all K is equal to the identity. So what you do to actually, uh, to effect this transformation, if you have such an A, B, and C, uh, Alice will cook up a partial measurement that has A as one of these matrices. Bob will do the same. Charlie will do the same. 
they'll just communicate all of their outcomes. And when they all happen to get the right answer, you know, associated with getting A here, B here, and C here, then they've prepared the state they want. The probability of that happening um, uh, uh, is, uh, again, non-zero if, if this is the case. And, yeah. Uh, anything you like. It doesn't need to be Hermitian. Um, let's see. Normalization of side two will be enough to make sure that they're small enough that I can fit them into there. And then uh, um, all I really, you know, this is sort of automatically positive, so I don't have any constraint on E. Yeah, so this is for two parties, and this is just me writing down the same thing, but for three parties. So I take it that if A and B are not unitary, yeah. in part case, so what this means is I take the answer to the answer I want, and then they normalize the case. You can do that, or you can just absorb uh, the, whatever normalization you were going to do into the definition of A and B. Yes. OK. So we have SLOCC. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, this is all still for SLOCC for pure states, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're not going to do SLOCC for mixed states. So this is a simplification. It lets us get to some places. But uh, like, as we'll likely talk about, uh, at least I'll say in passing, like even with you, when you have three parties, solving this problem is NP hard so, and a pure state. So making mixed states is even worse. OK. So I would like to now do the, uh, just look at the bipartite case uh, in terms of SLOCC. Even though we've solved the bipartite case with regular LOCC, understanding what happens with this um, is going to help us understand a little better um, the tripartite and higher partite cases. OK, uh, so let's look at the bipartite case. So I have a psi. It lives in CA tensor CB. Um, I can think of this as being a matrix instead of being a vector just by sort of turning around one of the, one of the elements uh, or one of the cats. Um, and then if I do a singular value decomposition on that matrix, it tells me that I can always write any psi as a sum over i, square root of lambda i, these lambdas sum to 1, mu i, mu i. The point is if I wrote out uh, in an arbitrary basis what psi was, I'd have to have different indices for, for both states. But by, by doing the singular value decomposition, I can ensure that there exists some pair of bases that let me write the state just like that. OK, and this is great because it means that psi is equal to uh, uh, some unitary, tensor another unitary, times some lambda tensor identity times phi sub d where this i runs over 1 to d. Remember, phi sub d is the maximally entangled state on uh, uh, 2D level systems. OK, so this means that certainly 
I can take phi sub d and turn it into psi under SLOCC. Because I'm giving you the matrix, right? This lambda is just the diagonal matrix with these lambdas in it, or square root of these lambdas in it. And these unitaries just map sort of the, whatever basis I'm using here to these two bases. Okay, so that's great. That means uh, phi sub d under SLOCC can be mapped to psi. Uh, but I can rewrite this, uh, yeah? I can rewrite this as u tensor v, u dagger tensor v dagger psi lambda inverse tensor identity. And as long as this lambda is actually invertible, right? So as long as all of the, uh, uh, the, the lambdas are non-zero, or the first d of them are non-zero, I can also go back. So the thing that tells me uh, whether I can go from one state to another now is uh, just the number of non-zero uh, these are called uh, uh, Schmidt values. This is what's called a Schmidt decomposition. Uh, but they're basically uh, just singular values of the matrix you get by sort of turning around one of, the, one of the vectors and turning it into a row vector instead of a column vector. Okay, and, and it really just says, well, um, oh, how many of these are there? Those, the number of them is just the rank of the reduced density matrix. And if I have big enough rank, I can always go uh, transform from one state to another under SLOCC. So if this is true, uh, then this is true. And vice versa. Yeah? So that's like. Uh, well, coarser information than what we got um, under LOCC, but it's a simple criterion and it's, it's something non-trivial. It's saying, like, if you give me a state, the rank of the reduced density matrix tells me something about how entangled the state is. It's coarser because we do lose information about how much, basically how much entropy is in these reduced density matrices. Oh. Sorry. So now, wouldn't you like to do three parties? Uh, actually, multi-parties. Uh, so first of all, I have a state psi on n parties. Ah, let's call them h. We can define the rank of the state to be the minimum R such that I can write the state as a superposition or a sum of a tensor product, sorry, I'm make sure J. Okay, as a, okay, so what, am I, what did I write there? If uh, I have a sum over a bunch of product states, so a tensor product of a state on the first, the second, the third, et cetera, and the rank of the state 
is just defined as what's the minimum number of terms in that sum that I can generate, uh, uh, that I can use to generate the state. So like uh, the rank of this, well, uh, guesses? D, done, good. Um, and then I claim that if I have a state that can be, uh, that can be transformed via LSLOCC to another state, then, then the rank, oops, then the rank of psi 1 has got to be bigger than the rank of psi 2. Why? Well, if I just take an optimal decomposition of psi 1, and if I can SLOCC convert to psi 2, that means psi 2 is equal to uh, some tensor product of some uh, matrices. But then I can push that tensor product through the sum to get this. which gives me a decomposition now of psi 2 into the same number of uh, terms as I had for my decomposition of psi 1. Right? So there's no way that this rank is going to go up under SLOCC. Um, so we want to use this, and in order to use this, we have to be able to calculate what is the rank of some uh, simple states, and to do that, uh, there's a little lemma we want. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, We'll just look at tripartite states now. Okay, and here's the lemma. Uh, I have some phi that lies in HA, tensor HB, tensor HC. Um, then, the rank of phi equals uh, the minimum number of product states uh, spanning uh, the support of rho AB. This is just the density matrix I get by tracing out C. Um, I think uh, I'm going to skip the proof of this, okay? I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, I appear to have misjudged how much time. Oh, you, have, you have more time today than last time. Oh, really? Yes, you have, you have like 80, 85 minutes today. Well, then I'm going to give you the proof, but I'm not going to take 80, 85 minutes, I'm but, afraid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll ask you lots of questions. <laughs> uh, okay, so let K be the uh, the rank 
of phi and let r be the minimum products uh, the the uh, minimum number of product states uh, spanning support uh, of row AB. Yes. Which means it's a convex combination of these uh, outer products of pure states. Yes. And the support is like the set of pure states of your image. Yeah, it's the it's the the, the the space spanned by those pure states. I see. Okay. And when you say space spanned, now yeah. that's well defined. It doesn't depend on how you decompose. No, it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. Okay, good. So now we're going to say, let's look at phi on ABC. I can think of AB as being as one, one system together and C as being a second system. And because of that, I can write uh, I just want to uh, I can write um, I'm, uh, a Schmidt decomposition of this thing across the AB cut C uh, uh, separation. Okay, so I have some mu i on AB, and I have some new i on C, and I'm leaving out the eigenvectors because uh, under SLOCC we don't care that much about normalization. We're just really going to have a normalized state and it, uh, whenever we're actually dealing with it. But to write things down, you can throw out the normalization. Okay, uh, the good news is that if I trace out uh, C, I get row AB, and it's a convex combination of these mu's. And each of these mu's, therefore, lives in the space of, uh, of uh, uh, well, supporting row AB, and therefore I can decompose it into uh, a sum or a superposition of just R terms. Okay, so I can write mu i equals sum over j from 1 to r, uh, sum lambda ij, alpha j beta j on uh, ab. Now I can substitute this expression into here, turn this, uh, the, the sum over i, I can now move into uh, just a sum over uh, these, and uh, uh, that gives me an, an explicit expression for phi in terms of no more than r product states. That's clear? You're happy, you nodded. Um, so that means uh, that uh, k, the rank of the thing, can't be any uh, smaller than the number of minimum, uh, the minimum number of product sta states spanning the support. But then, I've, since I've also given an expression for phi, let me just erase over here. Since I've also now given an expression for phi uh, in terms of uh, our product states, uh, 
I can use that uh, to write out over OAB uh, like this, JK, AJ, BJ, AK, uh, BK times the inner product. And this shows now the support of just row AB uh, is spanned by the same set of product states. Okay. So that means uh, uh, R and K are equal. So now we have, at least for tripartite pure states, um, a tool that we can go and use to calculate what some of these ranks are. So I would like to now uh, show you some examples of, uh, of states for which we can calculate the rank and therefore for which we can answer the question of interconvertibility. Again, this, this rank is going to be mostly useful for showing that you can't move from one state to another. Uh, it's not sufficient uh, for interconvertibility. Uh, it's it's uh, just necessary that your initial state have higher rank. Okay. So three examples. Um, something called a GHZ state. Uh, It's just a superposition of all zeros on the three parties plus all ones on the three, uh, three parties. And uh, we call GHZN uh, just uh, the same thing but with more levels. And this is just three guys, Green, Greenberger, Horn, Zeilinger, who came up with this state and um, pointed out it has sort of interesting properties. In particular, there's no, uh, there's no sort of local hidden variable theory for describing all the measurements that you can do on it. It's sort of non-classical in some way. Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, another state that we'll be interested in comparing to the GHZ state uh, is a W state. Uh, my colleagues at, uh, uh, in the physics department especially like this because uh, uh, they call them Dickey states and they're sort of, you can think of it as like a single excitation existing in some some three atoms, let's say. Um, so it's sort of, there's exactly one one in each of these terms. And you can generalize that too, although we won't. Uh, yeah, just a, a comment. We've seen this tensor several times before this week. This is the unique 2 by 2 by 2 tensor of rate 3. And it's also the multiplication tensor of C of x mod x squared. So this is the, that same tensor that we've seen in multiple times. Ah, good. That's exciting. Uh, actually, I cannot. Uh, uh, I will. I, I, you know, I'm gonna, I can find out, but I, I just I don't know. I don't think it's somebody's name. Um, okay. Okay. Now, speaking of multiplication tensors, uh, this is we'll call it phi three. Uh, it's just a phi naught uh, a b. Phi naught uh, AC, phi naught uh, BC. So let me draw some, I want to draw some pictures of these things too. So this is a GHZ state. Uh, we have three parties. And they're all kind of well, uh, sort of correlated uh, perfectly in a particular basis. Uh, and the phi 3. What's that? I have the same three parties. Oh, we'll call this Alice, Bob, and Charlie. I have the same three parties. But now, uh, Alice and Bob, you know, I'll just draw it first. 
Alice and Bob, uh, sorry, Alice holds a uh, maximally entangled pair, phi naught, with Bob. Bob holds a maximally entangled pair uh, with, uh, with both, Al oh, sorry. Alice has a maximally entangled pair with Bob and another one with Charlie. Charlie has a maximally entangled pair with Alice and another one with Bob. Bob has a maximally entangled pair with Alice and Bob as well. Right? So it's, it's a bunch of bipartite uh, entanglement distributed amongst them. OK. Uh, so is there much difference on the five chains of the chain setup? Uh, versus the number of vertices? I mean, doesn't Alice have an entangled maximum entangled pair with Bob and Bob with Charlie and Charlie with Alice in the chain setup? Up here. Uh, uh, no, no, actually, uh, not. Uh, let's see. Let's try to, uh, let's write down. Um, uh, maybe the simplest way for me to, okay, here's, uh, it, it depends a little bit what your question is meaning, but if I just write down row AB here, the density matrix is a half, zero, zero, plus a half, a half one, one. Um, for, for the GHC state. And then you can see actually that's, that's not entangled at all because I've just written it as a convex combination of product states. So they can't get anything out at all if they wanted to distill. This is sort of genuinely three partite and this is kind of like a bunch of bipartite stuff tensor together. Okay, uh, so uh, the rank, let's look at the rank of uh, the GHZ state. Two? Yes. For, for, this, for, this one, uh, for this one, it's two. And in general, it's just n. OK? Um, and that tells us, actually, that, uh, that I can use a GHZ Uh, to generate any state phi uh, exactly when uh, uh, the rank of phi is less than or equal to n. So the only if is basically because, well, the, the rank can only go down. Yeah. And then the if is because if I give you uh, a decomposition of, uh, of uh, phi into a bunch of product states, Uh, I can always get to this from the GHZ state uh, by, by sort of defining some new A, B, and C that map uh, uh, the i uh, basis vector to A sub i, and so on. Uh, and this is GHZ sub R, where R is the rank of what this thing is. Okay. Uh, uh, so now um, we've calculated the rank of the GHZ on uh, just qubits, and that was two.
Now, the rank of W, Josh just told me, right? It's three. Uh, uh, and um, um, let me tell you, maybe, because I'm going to tell you why I think it's three. And then you're going to see how. Um, so that's good. We, have, we haven't actually proved it's three. Just several people have stated that it's three. So, yeah. Okay. Maybe I won't prove it's three by your standards, though, right? I, sorry. We haven't even hinted it. Okay, okay, let's. Yeah, why should it be three? Um, well, let me write uh, a decomposition of W, a Schmidt decomposition of W, okay? It's actually easy. It's kind of already in a Schmidt base. It's already in a Schmidt, uh, a diagonal form, basically. So I'm going to write a Schmidt decomposition across A, B, and C. Then W is equal to 1 over root 3. Um, 0, 0, 1 plus 0, 1 plus 1, 0, 0, right? So that's a good Schmidt decomposition because, well, what's supposed to happen? Uh, these are supposed to be orthogonal, which they are, and these are supposed to be orthogonal, which they are, okay? So that tells me what? This tells me that row AB uh, is going to be equal to, uh, 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 well, maybe let me just say this. The, sp the span of row AB uh, equals the span of 0, 0, and 0, 1 plus 1, 0. And this is orthogonal to those. And if you wanted to get the span to be, oh, now we care about how many product states does it take to generate this span. Well, this is a product state, so we're happy with it. This is not a product state, uh, so we'd like to figure out if we can get rid of it in some way. Um, but we're not going to have any luck getting rid of it by, by adding some uh, part of 0, 0, or taking away some part of 0, 0. That's orthogonal to it. Uh, so the only way we're going to generate this from product states is to have two product states instead of one. Another way to say that is this is actually equivalent to a maxly entangled pair, so you're never going to generate it as a product state. So you need at least three. And then, well, we do it with three. So the rank is three. And this, uh, this, okay, tells us, right, that, that uh, 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 the rank is 3. That means you cannot generate, um, you can't take a GHZ state and generate a W state out of it, even via SLOCC. Um, I'm going to leave out a proof. It doesn't depend on rank. It depends on, like, sort of... Uh, Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, it's also the case that you can't go from a W to a GHZ via SLOCC. And as far as I understand, that's just like, uh, I mean, sort of algebraic jujitsu. Like, you know, it depends on all sorts of special things that uh, I, I, I uh, you know, you do some algebra and it's the case, okay? Um, so what does this mean? This means, okay, there's an old paper that was really, that I really like by Durer and uh, Vidal and Serac. It's called uh, two qubit, three qubits can be entangled in two different ways, okay? So it means that like, well, if I have three qubits, there are actually six different classes that are SLOCC um, equivalent to within the class, right? So there are product states. Um, there are sort of states that are, have entanglement between A and B, but C is a product with the rest. 
uh, there's entanglement between B and C, but A is a product with the rest. And then there's entanglement between A and C, but B is a product with the rest. So these are all bipartite. And then there's just sort of uh, GHZ and W classes. And uh, within this class, you can go, you can interconvert between all different states. And within that class, you can interconvert between all different states. Uh, but you can't get a W from a GHZ and you can't get a GHZ from a W. Um, and just as an aside, there's, uh, uh, these are kind of generic and these are measure zero, but uh, 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 there's still sort of uh, um, a lot of them, let's say. They have, there are three parameters describing this family and five describing that. Okay, and actually, you know, if you get really excited about this, there's another paper that came out several years later called uh, Four Qubits Can Be Entangled in Nine Different Ways. And there's, I forget what the five is, but there's one that's like five qubits can be entangled in that many different ways. And nobody, like, it just gets really hard really fast. Uh, okay. Uh, let me write out one more thing I want to say about um, entanglement, SLOCC interconvertibility. Um, I'll erase this and I'll come back to this board. Okay, now all I want to do now is write out this state in a, in a sort of more explicit way. Um, okay, so I'm going to sum over, well, remember what phi naught is. It's 1 over root 2. 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Okay, so let me just write what this phi 3 is really carefully. Okay, it's going to be, well, okay, what did it have? It had maximally entangled pair between a and B, and then another between A and C, uh, and then another between B and C. A, B, yep. Um, let me write it out like this. It's a sum over I, J, and K. Why? Because I'm going to have three sums over, over 0, 0, 1, 1, yeah? Then I'm going to say I have an I, K on A. I have a K, J on B. And then I have uh, an IJ, A, B, on C. And, you know, I left out the normalizations, fine. Um, so, you know, these two indices are the maximally entangled pair between Alice and Bob. These are the maximally entangled pair between uh, Bob and Charlie. These are the maximally entangled pair between uh, Alice and Charlie. Um, so does anybody like this, this, this state? You like it. I would like it more if you wrote the J-I-N-T. Would you? Well, I'm happy to oblige. <laughs> it's a local unitary. It's only a local unitary. There. And now it looks better, right? It looks kind of like matrix multiplication. Um, uh, uh, I'm told people call this the matrix multiplication tensor, right? Okay, so like uh, I can tell you the rank of one copy of it, uh, it's seven, right? Uh, uh, that's cool. Be this is something, apparently this has something to do with Strassen. No, Strassen showed this. It's how many multiplications you need to do two by two matrix multiplication. Um, and actually, I, I, can, I can write down something that if you like that tensor, you probably like this number even better. Lambda is uh, uh, the smallest uh, 
u such that I can LOCC interconvert u times n copies of a GHZ state uh, uh, into n copies of this phi 3. And anybody want to call, pick a, a Greek letter to call that? I call it omega, yeah? It's the exponent for matrix multiplication. Uh, so actually, if you go into like the quantum information literature from the 90s and so on, you find people slowly discovering and, and, and digging into ideas from, uh, f from the math and computer science literature to learn more about this SLOCC interconvertibility. Um, and, and of course, this, depending on what your, your inclination is, tells you don't go off and try to figure out uh, what, what is the optimal rate of interconversion for any pair of states, right? Because this is a pretty hard problem. And for an arbitrary state, um, uh, for an arbitrary state, figuring out whether or not a GHZ state can be mapped via LOCC uh, to that, SLOCC to that state, uh, is also very hard. So it's, I guess, implicit in, in Hastad's paper from the 1990 that that's NP, uh, NP hard, okay? So uh, even with these simplifications, it gets to be kind of complicated, uh, uh, but there are things that you can answer, okay? And I could also write down, it's fun, because, because these are actual states people can make, it's fun to say, okay, what's the rate at which I can turn GHZs into Ws, and how many you know, Ws can I get out if I have this many GHZ states? And we can kind of answer questions about that um, for small numbers of stuff. Okay, so that concludes the first part of the talk. Um, yeah? <laughs> is there any meaning to the rate at which we could, we could convert Ws into matrix multiplication tensors? Um, I, I can't, I don't know. I, that's the best I can do. Josh might know. There's a, so the, the small Coppersmith linear graph tensor is a, instead of a two by two by two W state, is kind of like a three by three by three W state in some sense. And so, can you tell me how to write it down? Uh, not off the top oh, of my head. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, but it, it, so, you know, building matrix multiplication algorithms using the Coppersmith winter graph tensor is close to an answer to your question. Yeah. Okay, now. So I've got a question related to this. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's some pretty new algebraic tools that I can do this pretty quickly in terms of um, mentioning the metric physics and the numbers of states you've got. Okay. I don't think you necessarily have to go to NP hard problems, but um, is there any specific reason other than. Um... No, I wasn't going to say that. but. Um, yeah, so you're, you're computing ranks of these, the GH set and the W for, for physical reasons. But yeah. After you, you decided the, the, the rank of these, when you're going to show that they are inequivalent in this example, yeah. does the rank even matter to a physicist at this point? Does, do you mean other than this one has more rank than that one? Yeah, yeah. So you, you've, already, you've already had this construction. If you're just trying to now show, oh, I can't get it from GH set W or W to GH set. Does it's kind of a crude measure of how entangled the state is, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Um, so it does matter. Like, if I, you know, zeroth order, if you go to someone and say, please make this state with, uh, you know, rank 1,000, that's a different, you're going to get a different response from please make the state of a rank of 2. Sure. Um, but there are usually, well. But it's not, at least how you presented it, it sounded like that you could, you, I mean, without actually knowing, doing a proof, you could maybe get from, W to GH set, right? From rank three to possibly rank two. Uh, in principle, yes. In principle, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, but, but in fact, you cannot. Um, but not for reasons related to this. Right, yeah. There's also some algebraic reasons, as you alluded to. Okay. Um, but my, I guess my question isn't so clear. Maybe we can talk afterwards. But um, 
I, I'm sorry, I want to clarify. When I said algebra, I didn't mean uh, fancy algebra. I meant high school algebra. That's right. Okay. Uh, okay, 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 let's do that. Uh, okay, so um, I talked a little bit. Okay, so we're moving on to uh, some uh, special states that we can actually, uh, well, that have, I want to talk about a family of states that are a good ansatz uh, for uh, physical states and also um, sort of char characterize uh, or, or a good ansatz also for s quantum computations that have a small amount of entanglement. Okay? And how much time did you really say that I had? So, so I'd say you have 22 minutes left. But I got an hour for the first part. <laughs> No? Okay. Sorry. I... Okay, good. Uh, you, can, you can come to the, to the party next week up in Cambridge and give us more hours. Uh, okay. Here I just actually don't want to go into quite nearly, n not even nearly as much detail, and indeed the plan was to spend like most of the time on section one and a little bit on two and three. So 20 minutes should be just fine. Uh, uh, so um, I want to show you an ansatz for a quantum state that uh, is useful, uh, as I said, in two directions. One, for describing physical uh, systems, at least in one dimension. And uh, two, for describing sort of low entanglement quantum computations. So let me, let me just write it down. Uh, now let's say I have n qubits. Um, well, uh, I can have a basis uh, where I is just a bunch, just an n-bit string. And for an arbitrary state, uh, I just write down any amplitude you like. Um, but I don't want an arbitrary state. I want a, a sort of simpler class of states. So let's write it like this. Trace of A1, I1, A2, I2, all the way up to trace of An, In. Now these A's uh, are going to be uh, D by D matrices. Okay, and uh, uh, for obvious reasons, I guess this is called a matrix product state, and people have used states like this since like the 80s to try to solve um, um, spin models for uh, um, local Hamiltonians, um, and m maybe, uh, well, Let me draw this in a nicer way so that I can have a picture of a quantum state instead. Okay, so what have I done now? Uh, this is a matrix, but it also has this index which says whether it goes with state uh, zero or state one on, on qubit one. So I've, uh, I've just drawn the, that as a three-legged tensor. And based on the fact that I multiplied and then took a trace, all those tensors together, uh, I can draw, uh, a, graphically I can represent this kind of uh, quantum state as a state on just the legs of all these exposed tensors down here. Or the, sorry, the, a state on the, uh, all these exposed legs down here. Um, and there's sort of another way that, that you might, well, might be, might be, well, I'll just draw it. There's another way, slightly different to draw it, that, uh, that makes explicit the relationship of the dimension of these matrices and the entanglement structure of this state uh, I can instead, in, instead of hanging the, uh, the legs off the side of these things, I can hang them off the top. Uh, 
And then I can just connect them with a maximally entangled state on a d-dimensional, or d-dimensional maximally entangled state. And that would go to there. And then I would have one big one over here. And actually, mostly for the purposes of drawing, I'm just going to like mostly leave out this extra thing here. You can do whatever you want. Uh, it doesn't really change the set of states that you can access very much, especially when you have a large number of qubits. Um, so uh, the first thing to note is this is a huge reduction in the number of parameters that I have. Right? I have only, uh, well, one of these things, uh, I have uh, two times d squared parameters, and I've got n such tensors. Uh, and uh, that's better than uh, 2 to the n parameters uh, if, if d is not scaling with n. And uh, yeah. Oh, oh, well, this is uh, phi, phi d, and, and it's a it's a uh, it's a state on two systems, and this is one system, and this is the other system. And the point is that because phi d just looks like this, multiplying a matrix or two matrices on either side of it is kind of like multiplying the two matrices to each other. OK, so this is, this is kind of good. We like it. It's not too many parameters. Uh, the other thing that we like is uh, it captures natural physics, cap captures uh, 1D systems well. Right? You see it's got a natural 1D structure. And in fact, you can show, though it's not easy, that uh, if you have a Hamiltonian that's gapped, Uh, that you know, the gra there's a ground state of the Hamiltonian, and then there's a gap until you get to the first excited state. That means that uh, that uh, you can describe the ground state uh, has a uh, constant bond dimension. Constant bond dimension. What's the bond dimension? It's just the dimension here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is that okay? Is this in the way? <laughs> Josh is looking uncomfortable. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, oh, what I wanted to say, uh, the bond dimension doesn't need to be too big. Well, uh, you can show, like, rigorously that the um, ground state of a gapped Hamiltonian doesn't need a bond dimension that scales with the number of qubits, which is nice. And then from a practical point of view, um, you could just go off and try to simulate, try to find the ground state of a Hamiltonian or simulate the dynamics of a system with some local Hamiltonian. And empirically, they find you don't have to make this bond dimension very big in order to get extremely high fidelity uh, ground states. Um, No, you could just get as close as you like. That's right. And, and really, like, like the, the mathematical physics results are, are like weaker than what people actually see, which is just like the, the difference by, you know, you, what they do in practice is you, uh, uh, you keep growing your bond dimension until you stop improving your energy, and then you stop. And they're really, really close. Like, if you give it a bunch of extra bond dimensions, it just doesn't use them. Um, OK, so these capture 1D systems uh, well. And another, another, um, uh, another thing that like, makes physicists like these is that uh, you can see it from this picture best. Uh, they satisfy something called an area law. So if I take some, some contiguous set of qubits and I say, 
what is the entropy of, you know, I take the ground state, and then I say, what's the entropy of this subset of qubits? If it's an entangled state, that's going to be non-zero entropy. And the, the, from this picture, you can see the entropy is going to be no bigger than this plus that, right? So log two, uh, log, uh, two times log the dimension. Uh, even though you can scale up the size of this thing big. So the entropy of uh, a contiguous system is not going to grow, is not going to grow with the number of, the number of systems in that, uh, that's, that system. Sorry, it's not going to grow with the number of qubits in the system. It's going to grow with, in this case, the size of the boundary, which is, uh, uh, which is just two. So it's not going to grow at all. And then if you had, there are, well, there are analogs of these in higher dimensions that have some of the benefits, and one of the benefits those have is that the entropy of a, of a big patch is going to grow like the boundary of it instead of like the, uh, the volume. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, another thing we like is we can update them after local gates. So let's say I have some matrix product state. Um, and then, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in one more. Uh, and then I apply a local unitary here. Well, if I'm, if I'm keeping a, if I'm trying to do a classical simulation of what this thing is, is doing, when I apply a local unitary here, I don't have to do much to my classical description. I can leave all these other A's alone, and I can just apply the unitary to this A2. So it's really easy to do an update based on a local unitary. It's a little harder if I wanted to do a two-qubit unitary. However, I'm certainly not going to have to act on anything other than just A3 and A4 in this case. Right? So I'm, if I want to update my description, oh, A2 tilde, um, I, I can find some A3 tilde and some A4 tilde. and all the others I can leave alone. So that's nice, uh, but now I have, I was going to write warning. Warning. Uh, for an arbitrary state, when I apply this C naught, I might change this dimension. I might have to make it bigger. If I want to make sure I maintain um, a small dimension, what I should do is like do my best approximation with a small dimension of what the state is going to be here. So I should truncate. I should do, basically there's a Schmidt decomposition I have to do and I should truncate that. And in general that's not going to work, but as long as I don't generate too much entanglement by applying this gate, that will work. So warning, I might have changed. A3 and A4's uh, uh, dimensions. That's, I mean, that's a good thing, right? Because we don't expect this to work for arbitrary states because then it would give us a classical simulation of quantum computers. We don't think that's possible or I don't think that's possible. Um, and uh, it's sort of, the point is if you generate, if applying the CNOT does generate extra entanglement between the two sides, it's going to have to blow up the size of this dimension the size of this uh, entangled pair uh, in order to faithfully represent the state. Um, yes. So he's saying, is, is it okay to have different bond dimensions on different uh, states? Well, huh? Bonds. On different bonds, right, exactly. As long as these two match up, that's fine, right? So this one had better match that one. Um, uh, maybe just one. We're getting there, right? Yeah, seven. Seven. Yeah. 
So, okay, good. Uh, then I'll just show you, there's another thing you can do. You can update, you can uh, 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 approximate the ground state. Well, sorry, they're good because you can approximate the ground state, you can update them. You can also find expectation values of local, um, of local observables uh, efficiently. Um, so, generically, I might have some operator on the second qubit, and I'd like to know its expectation value. You could let, keep in mind the example of uh, just a z on the second qubit and identity everywhere else, right? Then it would be, did I tell you about z? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, you could just make it a projector onto a zero on the second qubit and identity everywhere else. And that would be like saying, if I'm trying to simulate a quantum computation using matrix product states, that would be like saying, what's the probability when I do my measurement of this quantum state that I get an outcome that is zero? Right? So generically, uh, computation, it's going to have, well, you, it's going to have a few bits of output maybe. And uh, if uh, yeah, you want to know what's the answer to the quantum computation, um, being able to estimate this expectation value is exactly the same thing using this operator as being able to uh, measure this qubit and ask what's the probability it became zero. Okay, so I can draw this like this. That's my state. I can put in my operator here, it's another matrix, and that's my uh, uh, row, uh, row vector. So to val evaluate this, I've got to go off and evaluate this inner product. And actually, you, uh, there's an easy way to go about doing that. So what you do is first, You can evaluate this. Uh, this is just a contraction of a three-leg tensor, another three-leg tensor, and a two-leg tensor. And you only have, what's this? This is d times d times d times d. So they're like d4 things you have to write down at the same time. So you're happy. You've started your, uh, your computation. And once you've got this object, well, uh, then you can sort of separately calculate this. Right? And then you can contract those, you're happy. Uh, and then you can sort of work your way all the way to the end by contracting uh, one qubit at a time. And the point of doing it in this order is to make sure you never accidentally blow up the size of the thing uh, you're trying to contract. Like you're not trying to sum over all of these tensors all at once. Okay? So the point is you can get efficiently, uh, you can efficiently extract um, the probability of a single qubit being zero or one, or actually a few qubits being zero or one at the same time. Yeah? Is it, is it okay for me to think about this as part of, part of or maybe the reason this worked is also sort of related to some kind of area law that like the boundary of the, the stuff I've contracted so far is a small way of setting up? I think that's like a necessary condition. The reason I don't want to fully, oh, uh, is the reason this works that we had this area law. Yeah, it's sort of, kind of, but not entirely, because uh, this works here, but in two dimensions, you could do the same thing. You could have this grid with all of these, uh, all of these um, legs hanging down, and then you bring another one up, and there's just one thing in the middle. We don't know good ways to contract that. Um, because, you know, if you tried to do this, you sort of start having too many too many legs to the things that you're trying to store in memory as you try to contract. So it doesn't work as well in 2D where there is still an area law. Okay, so uh, very briefly, let's look at a more general uh, ansatz for a state. These work for gapped systems. Um, there's a lot of interest among physicists in understanding gapless systems, 
uh, because those are systems that are sort of in the process of undergoing a phase transition. And uh, people have suggested uh, ANSATSs that look kind of like this that are designed to capture what happens in those, in those critical systems. So I will now draw a picture of such an ANSATS and say a few suggestive things and then conclude. That's okay? Okay, so now we've got a bunch of qubits. How many do I have here? Oh my heavens. One, two, three, four. Okay. It's easier if I start with boxes than qubits. Okay. Huh? The robots are yes, exactly. Uh, and they have a very hierarchical uh, uh, organization. Uh, so uh, first I'll draw the picture and then I'll, uh, I'll talk to you about what it means. All right? There are now two kinds of tensors in the picture uh, instead of one. Uh, so it's not as bad now. Uh, oh, I should have said the name. This is called a multi-scale entanglement renormalization and sense. Mira. Um, Okay, uh, is it clear what's happening yet? Because I ran out of space. But the point is, as you go up, uh, you have these uh, disentanglers and then these things that basically coarse grain. And you can have, you would store, you know, I would keep going, these would go up to one disentangler uh, and these would go up to another and then way up there, there would be like one triangle, okay? And each of these Tensors is meant to capture the, uh, either the entanglement or the residual uh, state um, at, different, at different length scales. So if you have n qubits down here, uh, uh, you can do this with log n depth or log n levels. And people find for this, you can play a lot of, the, well, you can play the same games as I just suggested for matrix product states, you can update from local operations sort of locally. There's, uh, and you can also evaluate um, local expectation values efficiently. And these do a reasonable job capturing, um, capturing critical systems. Uh, I'll just say as an aside, these things also you can see are doing something that kind of looks like a hyperbolic geometry. So like if I drew a circle and like built a tree that kind of does this, gets smaller as you go out. You might say that these states kind of naturally fit into this geometry. Uh, and people have been playing a lot of games like uh, using these kinds of states, trying to understand, um, uh, well, um, stuff in physics related to hyperbolic geometry. Let's say that. So there's the idea that, that if I have hyperbolic, uh, uh, if I have a space of constant negative curvature, I can describe quantum gravity in that space in terms of uh, conformal field theory on the boundary uh, of the space. And these are good at describing conformal field theories. So maybe you can build some intuition for quantum gravity uh, by looking at these kinds of states. Um, with that, I will remind you, okay? Quantum computers, we think, can do things faster than, uh, do some things faster than classical computers. Um, so, uh, based on what I just showed you, you better have some entanglement in your quantum computer or you have better have scaling, entanglement scaling with the number of qubits you've got in your quantum computer or uh, you'll have a classical simulation. Uh, so we should study entanglement for that reason as, uh, as well as others. Um, we can get a handle on multi-party entanglement um, even though it's hard by thinking about 
uh, about uh, SLOCC and tensor ranks and stuff like that, uh, and also some of our best algorithms for simulating quantum systems, quantum computers, um, uh, sort of use tensor network states uh, that are sort of explicitly considering what's the entanglement left in the state. Um, and in order to get quantum speedups, we do have to break these classical simulations in some way. So that's it. So um, in, in states like this, mm -hmm. um, you said you know, these triangles here are sort of coarse grainers. Yeah. But I mean, there's still some sort of three tensor, yeah. right? Um, can you tell, like, for example, can you learn things about SLOCC reductions between states by trying to represent them perhaps not quite faithfully this way, uh, but, you know, this is supposedly a smaller representation. And the question is, does this sort of destroy everything about SLOCC, or can you actually still still say something using these compressed representations? Either these or the matrix product states, I guess. I mean. uh, uh, um, let's see. I, huh. uh, well, certainly it's, it's, okay, what would you need with a matrix product state if you wanted to have SLOCC interconvertibility? You had better have, well, up, ah, I should have mentioned something else that's kind of annoying, but there's, there's, there's a lot of freedom in these representations because I could have put a unitary up here and down there, like you, you dagger along the, any leg. So I need some sort of actually some uh, um, canonical form that I'm gonna use. Um, and why am I saying that? Because what I want to say is it's a matter of just looking at, you know, what we want to know is, is there some, is there some uh, matrix one and matrix two such that this is equal to this, right? That's the, that's the question, and then um, you're right that for matrix product states that should be easier than the generic one because we can sort of reduce it to a question about this guy and maybe a little bit about that guy because we have a unitary freedom on one side of this. So I hadn't thought of it, but y you may be right. I think you're right. But maybe not for these more complicated, hmm? like the Mara. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure for those. Yeah. So you showed us that four pure states, uh, one thing can be slocked into the other. Yeah. Uh, if we can just multiply them by uh, product of matrices, and therefore we can never increase the right? Yeah. Um, but isn't that true for like, the joint density matrix between states? Because you can have like states? I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is that it's really not. I don't feel in my heart why classical communication would not increase tensor rank. It can certainly create correlation between classical rank variables, um, but somehow that's not what tensor rank is capturing. Or is that only a statement about the pure state? I can. I, I um... <laughs> why, why, why can't classical? Okay, why can't classical communication increase tensor rank? Uh, or is it just that the SLOCC protocol that change pure states to pure states update that? Okay, uh, okay, here, uh, let's see. Why can't this? Mm -hmm. 
confusing as it's somehow massive communication, which can create massive correlation, doesn't seem to change. Okay, okay, okay. So I okay, if if we were okay. Why can't classical communication increase tensor rank? Uh, so let's look at a bipartite state. So for pure states, you're happy, right? Or not? I, I mean, I believe what you said. Yeah. It's not obvious to me at all that that, that that is true about the SLS and CUs. Well, it's not obvious that. SLOCC will not increase it, or the classical communication will not increase it? You told us that yeah. two pure states are one slot to the other if yeah. there is a, a, tensor, a, a tensor product matrix which will get from one to the other. Right? Yeah. So I don't see why that's true, but I, I accept it. Oh, but let me tell you why it's true. For each matrix, uh, I can always cook up a measurement that's just going to leave as the residual state uh, a, you know, that matrix times the state they were holding. Having done that, I can just report to my friend that I got the right answer. And then he can do the same measurement and try to, do, uh, try to report back that he got the right answer too. And when we all got the right answer, we've implemented this, this tensor product multiplied by the state, right? If there's no such decomposition, when we try to do, uh, well, there's going to be no such measurement. Right? Well, does that sort of sound like a maybe? Yeah, maybe we can. All right. Maybe we can pick it up. Okay. 